Hi, I'm Brian Gallagher. I'm the former CEO of United Way Worldwide, and thanks for joining us for this uh, panel discussion called The Magic of Communities, Scaling Trust in Uncertain Times. Um, you know, I don't know that uh, trust has ever been more important in terms of building social capital around the world, uh, nor have we been as challenged as we are right now trying to figure out how to build social capital in a digital age. And we've got a great uh, panelist to help us think through some of these some of these challenges. Just a couple of opening thoughts before before we kick off the conversation. You know, it strikes me that over my career in the nonprofit sector, um, it struck me that trust is the currency on which social capital is built. You know, you need you need a good economy. You good, need good government. You need strong communities. But what holds it together is social capital and trust is the glue that creates that social capital. Remember, uh, I remember a research project done by the School of Public Health at Harvard a number of years ago that was measuring social efficacy in in different neighborhoods uh, in Chicago and the U.S. And they measured social efficacy in both very wealthy neighborhoods and very poor neighborhoods. And it was the, what drove the, the efficacy was whether people knew each other by first name or not, whether the adults knew the children. And so it didn't matter whether you were rich or poor. Um, it's it's whether you knew each other and trusted each other. It was a it was to me a very compelling piece of research. Um, today's conversation is going to be a, how do we scale trust? You know, you can obviously build trust between individuals within families, communities, in the workplace. We're talking about trying to do it do do it at a at a societal scale. And um, as you probably know, trust is at a pretty historic low across the world right now. Uh, in fact, according to the Edelman Trust Barometer uh, that they put out every year, usually release it in Davos at the World Economic Forum annual meeting, uh, trust is at, at a historic low. And uh, business, the business sector is the sector that is leading in terms of trust across the world. And if you look at uh, the 2021 report from Edelman, it's alarming how much the trust in the U.S. government and the Chinese government, for instance, on behalf of their people have dropped in a year. Uh, so two of the most important countries, economies in the world, and their people don't trust their governments. Um, inequality obviously is a big part of uh, driving uh, the lack of trust across the world right now, people not feeling included. And the last thing I would say about trust as we get into this conversation is that uh, as Edelman would define it, um, it's, it's around, it's centered on ethics. Uh, do people do what they say they're going to do? Are they dependable? Are they competent? So it's not just, you know, being truthful. It's actually being competent and, and delivering on the, on the things you say uh, that you're going to deliver. Um, last, last thing I would say, and then we'll, we'll ask our panel to share, to share their comments. You know, I, I open by saying we're trying to figure out how to build social capital in a digital age. You know, we're swimming in data across the world, but I don't know that we've figured out how to produce knowledge today. Um, I don't know that we've yet figured out how to create common agendas across communities. We knew how to do it when it was institutions working with each other and institutional leaders. But now, as literally billions of people have access to the same data, how is it that we create commonality? You know, individual freedom seems to be um, kind of the... The, the call of the day, and yet it always leans up against the tension of collective responsibility. And so we're living in a time that it for sure feels like a inflection point for society as it relates to trust. And we've got such a great group of people to, uh, to help us think through the building of trust to rebuild back communities across, across the world. And I'm going to refrain from introductions. You all have the introductions. We don't have enough time to do that. So let me uh, let me just start by asking Wendy Woods, Vice Chairman, Social Impact for the Boston Consulting Group, if Wendy, you would lead off with uh, a few minutes of your thoughts on, on the topic. Thank you, Brian. And I'm really happy to join you today. And, and thank you for setting us up so well. Good um, I want to talk for a couple minutes about COVID vaccines and confidence and trust in that system, because I don't think there's a more 
um, urgent conversation in much of the globe today than how we roll that out. And you teed up something really helpfully with the Edelman trust barometer, which is trust has two sides. Um, there is a trustworthiness of the institution, the system, and then there are the individuals and the communities that we are asking to extend the trust. And too often when we talk about scaling trust, we talk about how do we build trust in communities? How do we scale trust? And I think sometimes we can skip that part about, well, what does it take to build trustworthiness? And how do we incorporate that in the system? And it's especially important when you talk about the inequities and it's especially important when we talk about COVID vaccines, because when we talk about the response to COVID, the rollout of the vaccines, right? We're talking about trustworthiness in a healthcare system. And if we're honest with ourselves, that it's a system that has let some of our communities down in many, many ways, uh, especially when you actually think about uh, some of the inequities based on that, uh, either based on income or certainly based on race. You know, we look at some of that data and just based on one of the very straightforward statistics, maternal mortality, right? It's five times higher for college educated black women than for college educated white women, right? And prevalence is not the driver of the conditions. It's really about a case fatality rate. So the trustworthiness of the system within certain communities hasn't always been there at the levels that we want it to. And so I just want to make sure that when we talk about things like vaccine confidence for COVID, we need to be thinking about two things. How do we raise the trustworthiness of the system? At the same time, we're raising the confidence and the trust in the communities uh, where it's actually appropriate and where it can be extended. Now, the really good news when it comes to COVID vaccines is that we actually have more confidence and trust than we do have, than we have hesitancy, right? And I think it's really important to lead with that. Significantly more people have gotten the vaccine and are planning to get the vaccine than those who say unlikely. BCG has done significant numbers of uh, surveys around this uh, during the, the entire pandemic period as it relates to a number of different dimensions. In our recent vaccine surveys, which is, is worth saying it was February, we've got about 60% of the population that has said, I've already had my dose in the US, this is, um, or I'm definitely planning to get it, um, likely planning to get it, versus only about 40% that are saying, maybe, I'm not sure, I've got some concerns or I'm, I'm fairly unlikely. So the good news is we're, the balance is tipping in the right direction at this point in time. Um, but it's interesting because when we talk about vaccine confidence or the flip side vaccine hesitancy, a lot of the conversation about building trust is about information and education. And that's not wrong, it's important, but it's only a part of the story. Because I think we also have to make sure that we do not underestimate the role that ease of access or just pure access has because Ease of access can foster confidence and difficult access is a significant part of actually driving and fostering and, and feeding unfortunate hesitancy. Um, when we dug into those surveys that we did a little more, um, there was a very strong correlation between income level and vaccine confidence. Higher income levels, higher confidence in the vaccine, higher intent to actually get the vaccine, right? Lower press levels, lower uh, confidence levels, higher hesitancy levels were in lower income populations. Um, originally, and this seems to be moving, which is really encouraging, but originally we had more hesitancy in minority communities, in black and brown communities than we did in the white population. As I said, the good news is that seems to be moving and in some of the more recent studies, we're seeing that equalizing some. But it's really important because there's been significant efforts to provide access. I don't want us to underestimate the fact that when somebody says, well, am I likely to get it? Question is, how hard is it for me to get? Right. And also, what are the social norms in my community? We've all learned a lot about nudge theory in the last several years. And I think one of the most important things we take from that is the importance of social norms. And the more people around me who trust, Right? The more people around me who have confidence in the vaccine, more importantly, the more people around me who've had access and have gotten the vaccine, the more likely I am 
to have confidence and trust and get the vaccine. So, and so I think in terms of building access and in building trust, uh, there's a real importance there in terms of actually making sure that it's feasible for people. It's great to have trust, but if you can't act on it, you're more less likely to have it. Yeah. So I want us to just come back to a couple things, which is, you know, as we think through scaling trust, let's make sure we're talking about both sides, the trustworthiness of the system, and then how we actually help individuals build and extend trust. And yes, information, education, influencers are part of that, you know, from people who are already trusted in those communities. But we also have to think about with the situation of COVID vaccines, the power of access and how that is important in building social norms, building acceptability. We all want to do what's accepted, right? And the power of that in extending vaccine confidence and building a trust in one of the areas that that I would argue is one of the more important areas for us to be able to build trust in right now for the, the world today. Wendy, it's such a, it's such a great, using, using the, the rollout of the vaccine, such a great example and, and um, use case for this, this idea of trust and trustworthiness and access. Thank you for that. Um, the, Doug Wilson is the, the chairman and CEO of the Leadership Alliance uh, in Orange County, California, a collection of uh, business leaders in Southern California, and Doug, the the um, the Edelman Trust Barometer says business leaders are the most trusted sector in the world right now. So uh, you've been working with business leaders, I would suspect, most of your career. And now you're you convene a group of them. What, what do you think the What do you think the most critical role is for business leaders right now, and how is it changing, if at all? Good question, Brian. Thank you very much. I'll take a minute to respond to that. So first of all, we found that we have to work with CEOs and it's great to work with business leaders, but if we're not connecting to the CEOs who can make the decisions and lead, it's really hard to drive change. And with that, the CEOs are committed not just to maximizing profit, they're committed to both an economic outcome and a social impact outcome. What does that look like? And we gathered together as 50 CEOs of the largest companies in Orange County. We've also brought together 10 different other regions that are large metropolitan areas working. has the power to convene large stakeholder groups. Government is not the answer to solving local problems. They help. Let's, that stimulus check is going to do amazing things. But for solving system-wide issues over time, it's hard. And it requires leadership. At a local level, where does that leadership best come from? It comes through CEOs using the power to convene, bringing together universities, government, nonprofits, all working together on a common problem you pick. We, for instance, have picked how we are going to create digital literacy for the underserved in our communities that are primarily Hispanic and Asian, many Vietnamese. And without our help, these people might go to college, but they have nowhere to go afterwards. They need connections into the business community because they're lost. They don't have the social network of wealthy people. To solve income inequality, money helps from government, but it's not the solution. It's private and public sector collaboration. The government can help by helping to fund multiple cities in, in a common area. That's what we're working on right now around talent. That will help solve problems. We're doing that with the universities. I just got off the phone with UCI, University of California, Irvine. They're doing amazing things, creating pathways, starting in grammar school, to ignite and excite the mind, to go into medicine. 
and then helping them through high school, into college, into medical school, graduating and going back into their communities to make a difference. Two major programs, yep. one with Hispanic and the other with African-Americans. So those are two stories without business leadership. I liked what Wendy said. The system must be trustworthy. This is an opportunity for business to shine. It's time for us to really step up, not just talk about it, but really do something in our communities. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vivian, um, and I should have asked you before, uh, Vivian Cow, is that how you pronounce your last name? Yes. So uh, Vivian is the, the founder and chief executive of Meteor One, and uh, you have such a fascinating background. Um, and so I want you to take your time to uh, talk about trust from whatever perspective you'd like to uh, you'd like to come at it from. But I would, if you see yourself um, free to do it, I'd love for you to interject digital technology for the first time into this conversation. So Vivian, please. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, and my great pleasure to be here with you all today. And uh, I definitely quite agree with Doug and Wendy's opinion. And today, global pandemic is not only a global public health emergency, but also causing economic recession and posing a very serious threat to the international and the local governance. So the crisis we face today demonstrates just how imperative it is for local government and community to provide residents with information and guidance. Community um, actually is just like the government, has a very similar opportunity not only to survive, but also to shine and serve the people. People need to be aware of what's happening locally, which resources are available, how they can help their community and keep others safe. We are all experiencing very fast realization that leadership and communication are very crucial to the success of the pandemic battle. Having the trust of people in the community is critical to the successful, um, very successful communication and the navigate navigation of the, you know, navigate the direction. And for example. Um, I think we can rely more on technology to maintain social distance and actively build trust among people. Trust will be skilled and the healthy environment will be improved. Trust is also um, built on a foundation of communication and information, but a crack information. Consistent and persistent transparent communication conveying the right message. Digital community, in particular, creates spaces for people to work towards a common good. There are a number, a number of very specific use cases where digital communities and the digital, uh, digital technologies help create an enabling environment for residents during the very difficult times, um, such as digi digital payment apps. Digital, because uh, I'm the firm that I operate. It's a recruiting firm. Uh, we have a recruiting staffing, and uh, we are all sourcing very top talented, like a computer vision, uh, computer vision or AI voice, face recognition uh, talent. So digital payment apps with AI voice and face recognition creates a shift to a cashless economy. Physical money currently act as a vector for the virus spread whereas technology makes payment possible and safe. Community should all encourage the startups more widely implementing the measures to shift the payment transactions towards mobile money and away from cash. And I think it is also recommended by the World Health Organization. Um, other use cases, such as the online business and e-commerce platform, the platform we use today around the world, also maintain a social distance and uh, st stimulate the development of our economy. And the uh, digital health infrastructure um, helps maintain community safely navigate the pandemic. Um, some uh, digital apps that we use, such as the telemedicine platform, um, I think uh, Wendy and Brian 
those just referred. So digital work and the learning process become a mainstream for business to connect remote workers or remote students across regions and even globally. Um, so learn from other communities who have pioneered the past and uh, found very successful solutions. Community should all come together under the existing international frameworks. And more digital leaders submit, such as Harris's global event that we have, we all attended today, under the digital platform, should be widely encouraged to um, that way we can form the coordinated rules to mitigate the economic damage caused by the pandemic. I think that's pretty much my sharing today. And I'm also very intrigued to hear more about other leaders like your insightful sharing. Thank you. Vivian, thank you. Um, you know, such, such a, you know, I know I'm going to come back. I'm going to tie in my first question after our comments, the idea of social norms and digital communities, um, mm -hmm. because it's it just, it you know, it's begging for a couple of questions there. And let me say to anyone that's uh, viewing the stream right now, uh, feel free to write in any questions that you might have in the comment section, and I'll try to monitor that as our last two speakers go. Uh, we do have a microphone that, you know, I will try to manage, but it will be easier for me to manage the comment section if you do that. Um, let me uh, let me turn it to Alpha Demolash, who um, is the Chief Executive Officer of Rising Tide, and it's, uh, Alpha, it's interesting listen, listening to Vivian talk about um, both the social um, benefits of, of digital technology, but she also talked about entrepreneurs and business startups. And you do a lot of work with entrepreneurs and working with upskilling and anything that, you know, these business uh, leaders need. I just wonder how you think about that. It's almost like now taking this a little closer to the ground in terms of what does it mean for people who are trying to run their business every day, start a business uh, and the support that they need. So please, your thoughts. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, I, I will jump right in into the action and say, so we run Rising Tide Capital, 17 year old nonprofit. We work with entrepreneurs who are predominantly in inner city communities and rural areas. Um, and they are your mom and pops, your startup entrepreneurs, 90% people of color uh, and women. Uh, and so a big part of what happened you know, during the pandemic is obviously the shutdown of so many of these businesses. And as you and everyone probably knows, over 50% of US employment comes from these very small businesses. And for the vast majority of uh, those who are people of color, uh, women, uh, the businesses they run are actually in the micro scale. And when we say small business in the US, it can go up to 500 employees uh, and 300 employees if you're in the service sector. But really we're talking about the vast majority of businesses owned in the US that employ the majority of um, these kinds of uh, folks are actually quite small. And so, I mean, the statistics are astounding. Uh, the role that these businesses play in society and our communities is huge. I don't think we adequately appreciate or understand the role of these kinds of businesses in building trust. I think it's to the detriment of actually many of our societies when we're thinking about political instability, when we're thinking about how do we accelerate trust faster than it is perhaps um, uh, disintegrating we really have to look at and learn even from natural ecosystems about how communities are uh, kept as, you know, woven together. And the role of these small businesses is tremendous. And when the pandemic hit, over 40%, I mean, right now we're dealing with the reality that 40% of such businesses are permanent, permanently shuttered, right? And they are the primary assets of many of these individuals in the US. And so we have our work cut out for us. Um, I will say that uh, our approach to this work, we work with about a thousand entrepreneurs in six cities in uh, New Jersey, and then we private label our solutions to other partners. So we're in, a, in nine other states. So the first thing that happened when the pandemic hit was actually I answered a call from the first lady of New Jersey 
to join the board of a pandemic relief fund that had been put together to, uh, you know, to look not only at the short term immediate crisis relief work, but also to begin to investigate the longer term work. So we've raised about now about 65 or so million dollars uh, and, you know, really looked at and said there is really no way to <laughs> segment this funding other than to say 50 percent to crisis, 50 percent to long term thinking. So we set up a weekly task force uh, for economic work stream uh, is what we call it, economic resilience. And really, as part of that uh, economic resilience work, we looked at the segment of the small business community that we thought was essential. And so we think, of course, food is critical, but from an economic standpoint, none of the small businesses nor the employees of bigger businesses could get back to work without childcare. So our first focus was to say, how do we actually bring back and shore up the childcare sector? And the thing about the childcare sector is 94% of the entire childcare sector in the US is these centers, and family care, business, uh, family care businesses, they're all basically small businesses. 94% of them are run and owned by women and people of color. And so from a, both from a social equity standpoint, as well as from the essential nature of the sector and shoring it up, we knew we had a big task ahead of us, not only in direct intervention and technical assistance and support and grants to these kinds of businesses, but the reality that we needed the bigger businesses as well as government interventions to shift policies to make it in any way viable for these kinds of small enterprises to be able to respond to a public health crisis and be able to feasibly care for children uh, in such constrained environments. I mean, when you look at even just New Jersey's mandates around child care sector, it's four pages, single spaced mandates around health. And when you think about what that did to their costs for these small businesses and what it meant for them to actually um, um, you know, uh, be able to work with the mandates and still serve and still make sure that the economy can get back, even in its limited sense, it was an extraordinary challenge. I'm happy to say that in six months, a group of multi-stakeholders who are coming, both including family care providers, child care centers at the table, philanthropists who are themselves, you know, ultra high net worth at the table, big businesses, you know, ranging from utilities to corporate and the government and policy shift. And we actually selected the United Way of Northern New Jersey because of its great work around a framework, which was asset limited, income constrained, employed. It's been doing this for over 10 years in multiple states, which gives us an indicator of what percentage of the state is actually working poor. And so we used right. numbers and data to actually drive at who are we trying to shore up? Uh, and we brought in a data team, the economists were involved, and we put together an initiative that is now fully funded for the next three years called United in Care, uh, that is piloting uh, initiatives to shore up in really innovative public-private partnership, uh, the child care sector. Most impacted, those tiny businesses uh, are at the table co-designing the solution for how we put the cover crops back on our uh, community landscape. Thank, thanks, Alpha. It, it's such a it's such an interesting point uh, or narrative about coming bottom up versus top down, and uh, you know the collective impact model is such an important construct for that. Uh, Kim Samuel is the founder of uh, the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness in Canada. Uh, Kim, you've done such important research and work around this idea of social isolation, connectedness as community. I just wonder how uh, what you would share with us that would kind of start to wrap up these uh, all these different ideas and, and great thoughts. Oh, thank you, Brian. I'll, I'll do my best. One of the uh, the things that has been coming up in me since this session started, well, one is how much I've learned, but another is that, as I think we can all see, this magic of community is really multifaceted. It's how we not only find interpersonal connection, but also meaning 
and identity. And I'm going to uh, touch on the the digital world that's been spoken of and and the um, the rest of the world. When the magic of community is missing, people tend to go grasping for it in ways that can be destructive. For example, joining online cliques based on conspiracy theories that point fingers at outsiders. When we share a neighborhood or rely on the same watershed or even simply work with other people in a shared office setting, we enter into a kind of reciprocity that we can't re easily replicate online. When we live face to face with other people on a continuous long-term basis, we have to build trust in one another, even if our opinions about politics or ethics might differ. When online platforms can connect people, it can be hard to replicate, let alone to scale up some of these vital elements. And of course, as everyone, uh, including you, Brian, and, and my fellow panelists have pointed out, trust is at the heart of everything. I, I talk a lot and write a lot about belonging. Well, you can't have belonging without trust as its foundation. Diverse cultural traditions, including those of many indigenous people around the world, identify reciprocity as a core social value and an indispensable element of trust. This vision of trust, grounded in respect for the worth and dignity of other people, as well as a recognition of long-term mutuality, contrasts starkly with so much of modern society's online discourse. What passes for trust on the internet is too often just reinforcement of our own opinions. A friend of mine, I could mention quickly, Kathy Calvin, who served as many, for many years as president of the UN Foundation, recently shared with me when we were discussing the topic of today, that you can sense a deficit of trust in online spaces in the fact that people today often don't know how much they can safely share about their opinions and feelings in the digital realm. And this can lead to a sense of uncertainty and vulnerability that's pretty antithetical to trust. But I believe there are meaningful opportunities for digital spaces to build trust in genuine community. It's a choice after all. I'll just mention a couple. I won't go into a detail uh, in, in the interest of having a, a bigger discussion, but I would, uh, top of my list would be Me Too and the Arab Spring and how Online connection enables migrants in new lands to maintain links to their communities and countries of origin while also building new communities through diaspora groups. Or Wikipedia, the Wikipedia Commons, uh, millions of volunteers uh, creating and uh, building the world's biggest multilingual uh, repository of knowledge. So I think that we need to not only continually invest, but also reinvest in communities, both in ad ad addressing the digital divide uh, and also uh, underlining most of all, making sure that we are ensuring that people in remote and low income communities have access to affordable broadband. And my fellow panelists have talked um, quite a lot about what's happening in the U.S. Uh, and, and there's a lot of need here and a lot of disparities and inequalities as we know. Uh, but I think it's also important to look at the responsibility of uh, countries such as the US or my country, Canada, to the rest of the world. In conclusion, as the world faces crises of pandemic and polarization, community is a solution to so many of the daunting challenges of our time. And as you and I were corresponding about, Brian, this month is the world marks the 10th anniversary of the start of the Syrian civil war, one of the worst humanitarian crises in recent history. I'm reminded of our shared responsibility to help millions of forced migrants to find a place to call home. This means more than offering asylum. It means ensuring that people are respected and represented as part of the social fabric and civic life of a community. Community begins with its definition of to commune, to find what's common to share. And my dream is that we and millions of others can continue to look at ways to do this for the whole world. Only that. Thank you.
Beautifully done, Kim. Thank you. Um, you know, I want to, uh, Dr. Cora Butler Jones has um, typed in a, a question very early on. And Wendy, I'm going to direct it to you, but for any of the panelists, and then I've got uh, a question that for, for everyone. And um, um, Dr. Butler Jones talks about why, questioning why marginalized communities or disengaged communities should trust when the, there's been so much history of abuse of that trust, the, you know, the Tuskegee experiments, there's, you know, what, what would you say to that, Wendy, in terms of your own research at BCG and, and then anybody else that would like to follow that? Yeah. And I think that's why I started with the trustworthiness of the system, because I do think we have to acknowledge right up front that in many places uh, in the past, right, the institutions and the systems that we are asking people to trust have not been trustworthy. And I think, uh, Dr. Corey, you're exactly right. Um, when we are starting at a deficit of trust, it's a lot different than we're starting on neutral ground or maybe even slightly positive, you know, halo or, or feelings. And it doesn't mean that we can't rebuild or build trust but it does mean that we need to honestly acknowledge that starting point. And I think what we found is as we're seeing in some places, the, the gaps in the confidence and hesitancy close, you know, in minority communities, it is because of the hard work, right? Of the individuals who are part of that community, who actually have more proximity to the system, who have sometimes privileged perspectives and views, Right. And actually doing an awful lot of work, um, not for the communities, right, but with the communities right. um, to actually do things that foster and build that trust and and in some ways provide the transparency. Um, I think a lot of what a number of the other panelists have talked about is is ways that you actually provide uh, visibility into the things that allow people to have more confidence and more trust. And uh, how do, I think how all do, of that is important. How would any of you respond to the, one of the, I, I didn't have this question in my mind until I heard, until I listened to all of you make your comments. How do we lean? What, what, what is the role of place going forward? Um, uh, versus and maybe not versus, but leaned up against digital communities. And, you know, as it relates to trust and access and resources and, you know, play, institutions in place used to be where it was built, right? And um, so how do you think we ought to think about that? And it kind of goes back to the, the, the norm question as well. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we norm together again uh, in a world that, seems to be pulled apart in so many different ways and the importance of place and what is the change role of place today if it is changed i'll just respond real quick that in our group and i'd love to hear what um kim would say here she's she's got some deep thoughts around this <laughs> yeah, I can indeed, tell. indeed. Yeah. uh but I can just say from practical experience, we've survived with Zoom, but we would not have survived as a CEO community if we did not have a way of connecting personally with each other before. And we are so eager to get back together again in place. Yeah. We can't wait. And people are hungry for it. Uh, and it's not just about processing ideas. It's about that sense of fellowship, that sense of community that comes with that, that's so important. And the, the, the laughs, the humor, the building the relationships, the um, just being together and all the nuances with it without place, it's very difficult to do that in my experience. And that's, that's the feedback we're getting as well. Yeah. Other thoughts? I, yeah. I, uh, I would just, just add that, that it's, vi it's vital, it's vital. And mm -hmm. I think that over the last year, uh, a, a lot of people have, have realized, maybe even for the first time, what the impact is of being isolated from yeah. people that, that you would work with, uh, be together with. And, and, and I guess I'd stay with work for the moment 
to say what it's like to be, and, and a lot of people still are working, working at home, working, working alone, and not having those things that we take for granted. So, to back to to what you were asking, Brian, when you mentioned when you mentioned place, I was thinking about it in a different context. I was thinking about place as as part of what belonging is. It's it's a, a sense of being grounded, a sense of being grounded with a place. But I think that I think that what uh, what Doug said is is really about what place means and what happens at a place in the way that we that we make that. And and really, this is about community. And I uh, I think that there's there's nothing more important. I think we've all learned what it's like not to have it. Mm-hmm. Um, no, go ahead, Alfred. please go ahead. I, I was going to say yes. Yeah, you know, we we are uh, embodied beings, and so even if we think we can pull off the the Zoom and the digital, and we can plug in and work, and which has huge implications for the future of work, but we still need to eat. We still need our homes to be you know taken care of, and and this is also part of the reason why you know we're we've been working so passionately with entrepreneurs, local place based businesses. It's like that's the thing that I think our world is not yet prepared for is uh, where the small businesses that make our places uh, so lively, you know, the restaurants, the, the places where we would go to have that sense of community. And it's not just about commerce. I mean, these businesses exist as facilitators of culture, as facilitators of connectivity. And I think that's that's the biggest um the biggest reflection that I have on place is that I think we we need it, we crave it. We're still embodied beings, and we need those hyper local institutions that could help help us have those experiences that could connect us to one another and foster belonging. So uh, we've got like three minutes left, but Vivian, can I ask you? You're you're in China right now, right? Yes, yes. And so I I've been to China twenty five or thirty times, and what I'm struck by is how how digital commerce is becoming the norm Mm -hmm. and and i and way beyond what we see in the us and canada and so forth and i wonder how your experience how the chinese economy and the chinese people and communities and culture are um, managing through that change this sense of place and community as the digital economy is roaring so fast ahead. Yes, this is also one of the reasons that's why I'm here to do the you know, business trip today. Um, accessing, I think accessing and managing money is one of the big, biggest challenging for people who are living in the poverty. Um, yet it is essential for them to unlock very basic services. And uh, as we move towards a very increasingly uh, digitalist world, and how, how can we ensure they aren't left behind? So uh, right now, Chinese government, they just take all the measures to implement, you know, the digital payment apps and uh, all the digital function uh, to enable all the small business and even startup to use those, um, you know, it, to live like in the digital world. And right now nobody's using the, you know, uh, cash or or a credit card is also very real to use as well. So um, digital finan- financial inclusion, I think um, is driving the next wave of the growth in the microfinance industry in China. And the increasing the access to smartphone is seeing a uh, you know, a, a shift from cash to digital finance for school fees, e- e-commerce, savings, credit card, and more. So mobile ho- mobile phones right now in China with all the digital apps and the inter- internet increasingly offer uh, alternative to that and the credit cards for making direct payment from any accounts. So right now, the government just takes the measures to make these possible and safe. So people, um, you know, trust the solution. So that's why even the people who are living in poverty, they use the digital solutions. They have the mobile phone to access the payment function. 
So um, yeah, I'm sorry yeah, to interrupt so, you. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's so it's really around access and ease and so forth. So um, let let me everybody take. Uh, we're just about out of time. So ten second headline um, in terms of a thought that you want to leave the audience with. Wendy, what's your what's your headline? We need more trust, but we need to deserve more trust. Need to earn it. <laughs> need to earn it. Doug, what's your headline? CEO potential is so big. Let's step up. Um, Vivian, what is your headline? Um, successful globalization needs a strong international organization or community support. Alpha. Mutual visibility and an acknowledgement that we are embodied and 